These are supposedly serious financial professionals that people rely on for guidance in their investments and in their retirements, their nest eggs. And somehow they thought this time was different. That, yeah. You know, the bond market vigilantes, they hung up their mask next to the Lone Ranger when he retired on the wall and it just everything would be fine. The Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Hey, got a real treat for you today. Uh, Lobo Tigra is with us and now. It's great to have you back on. Hey, first, Lobo, I want to bring up something. Just had an interview with Michael Pento. You guys, everybody out there knows Michael. Well-known, definitely a proponent of gold, but a proponent of making money in whatever the market is doing. He says that the government bond market, treasury market, has basically collapsed or is in a state of terminal collapse, and it's going to get really, really bad because the Fed cannot cut rates. Uh, with the two-year uh, treasury at or near the federal funds rate, they have no choice. They've got to keep hiking. What is your take on this? Well, one, it's astonishing to me that anybody on Wall Street is astonished by this. It's It's been the chatter of the, of the uh, mainstream financial media for the last couple of weeks that the, suddenly the bond uh, vigilantes are charging back into the fray like it was ever even an option that they wouldn't. Like it was imaginable that somehow you could have record tightening by the Fed with no consequences or no response from the bond market. I mean, the bond market is the the means right for transmission <laughs> so i mean it's i'm laughing but it's really not funny these are supposedly serious financial professionals that people rely on for guidance in their investments and their retirements their nest eggs and somehow they thought this time was different that yeah. you know the, the bond market vigilantes they hung up their mask next to the lone ranger when he retired on the wall and, and just everything would be fine so well, just, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. You have a thought? So just 0% interest rates. You know, how long can you do it for? Uh, we were talking earlier pre-call and every time in the past 10 years that the Fed tried to normalize rates, meaning bring them up to the 5% traditional historic rate, the stock market would have a fit and then they would back off almost immediately. But now... The uh, rates continued to go up for the past year, and the stock market until recently just shrugged it off. Right. So I think that's partly just almost a Pavlovian's training response. The markets have been trained that the Fed would come to the rescue, whether it's the the you know the Fed put or however you want to put it. And the Fed, you know, to be fair, Powell and his and his pals there have been trying really hard to quash the Fed put, to try to tell people higher for longer, and we really mean it. And it's a, another astonishing thing. You know, the, the adage amongst investors is don't fight the Fed. And the market has been fighting the Fed for a year and a half, more. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember as a gold bug that, you know, these Main Street types would look down their long financial noses at us and say, oh, you're trying to fight the Fed. Well, now they've been doing it, and and they're surprised to find that they're getting um, bloody noses in the process. Uh, but here's the thing, though: there there are real issues to consider here, and, and this time is not different, not in a fundamental way. But there are some important things. So, if that Fed put is finally going away, then the support and the astonishing level of complacency in mainstream markets that we've seen, that's now at risk and, you know, big things could happen. I don't, I don't make any fiery predictions here, but let's just say if, if that support goes away, it's reasonable to think that we could see some big changes in market dynamics. Uh, the other thing is, and this isn't original to me, a lot of mainstream people have pointed this out, but I don't know that they've really thought it through, is that so many businesses uh, and even the government itself had uh, taken out debt at low rates, right? You remember Trump was out there saying, you know, it's zero, it's free. We should be borrowing more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't agree because, okay, it's zero now, but not when you have to roll it over. Um, and it's still debt, right? It still has to be repaid. 
But this applies to households and it applies to businesses. You know, people keep saying, well, how can we have this tightening? How can you normalize after a decade plus of easy money and not have more things break? I've been saying things like that myself. It seems astonishing that we've gone on this long. And a big part of the answer seems to be it, um, that a lot of companies did finance at low mm -hmm. prices. It's the same way a, a household that locked in a mortgage at, you know, 3% or something, you know, now they're sitting pretty. They, they, that mortgage is a valuable asset for them and it enables, um, you know, a, a different set of financial choices than if they were a first time home buyer now. Uh, so the short version is that the government distortions that we've seen in the marketplace have had this, you know, exceptional distortions are having exceptional impacts. Now, I, I can't say, OK, this is it. You know, Carrie, it's it's the balloons going up. You know, it's, everything's going to blow up now. We're going to have this market meltdown by the end of the year, and it's all over. It's game over now. That would make for a great headline for you. Lots of clickbait. Good but clickbait. Nobody really knows that. You know, we've heard things like that for the last year, the last two years. Sure. Really, we heard that since 2020. So, you know, it could happen. We we could be at the tipping point now, where the bond market is going to just you know, forget the Fed taking the punch bowl away. The, the bond market's going to smash that punch bowl on the floor. It'll be down for the count. That could be what we're about to see, but not me, not, you know, the most famous guy on Wall Street, not, you know, Jamie Dimon, nobody knows. Um, but, I, okay. but I think it's prudent to, to prepare for stormy weather here. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, this is the problem with uh, central planning, right? Uh, when you try to plan an economy and make it to uh, happen all the time, so it's running on all cylinders, eventually you're going to have the crash, right? There's nothing new here, is there? It seems to me, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but it seems like a system with positive feedback that, that uh, oscillates farther and further out of control. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, it was a mistake to bail out X, Y, or Z, you know, too big to fail in 2008. But that was in response to prior distortions, the dot-com crash. And that was in response to prior distortions. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, ultimately it goes all the way back through history, but I think we can more conveniently put a beginning point to all of this wildness to Tricky Dick Nixon putting the U.S. completely off the gold standard in 1971. And after that, you know, there there were market volatility, things that had to do with the market itself, not necessarily government interference. But what that did was it completely severed the global financial system. Because remember, everybody, Bretton right. Woods, was relying on the dollar because it was as good as gold. Um, so taking the dollar off the gold system took the entire global economy off any connection, anything physical, anything real. It all became uh, you know, figures on ledgers and computers and therefore subject to uh, all kinds of crazy shenanigans that just weren't possible when you actually had to have the gold somewhere or at least some claim or some semblance of, yeah, trust us, it really is in Fort Knox, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it is. And West Point, supposedly, and someplace right. else. Right. But so what I'm saying is, you know, okay, Richard Nixon got on, the, right. on TV and said, don't you worry, don't you worry, your pretty little heads, your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today, unless maybe you happen to want to import a few things, but patriotic Americans don't want to do that. We want to buy American. Uh, uh, yeah. And ever since then, you've had this, this system that vacillates from one direction to the other, each time more extreme, you know, and mm -hmm. as bad as we thought the, the dot-com situation was, that really turned out to be a minor kerfuffle compared to 2008. And everybody was talking about unprecedented off the charts, how terrible 2008 was. We call it the GFC, the global financial crisis, like the Great Depression. And you look at the charts and all the crazy stuff that was done in response to that, it barely registers compared to what was done in 2020. Like the, the, we are so far off the deep end, so mm -hmm. far beyond insane in our responses here that, um, you know, it's, it's not crazy to think hard about how to protect yourself from things getting really beyond their control. Hey, and let's not forget that the Fed's emergency discount window program to keep banks afloat, every week, the balance owed to the Fed under that program goes higher. 
That's not the sign of a healthy banking system, is it, Lobo? No, not at all. And the fact that they did that, I mean, they keep saying, oh, the the uh, U.S. banking system is safe and resilient and all this stuff. Um, but that measure, and it wasn't just the trouble banks, it's all the banks, and they're using it, right? That measure will redeem your underwater, your in the red paper at par. And and what it's redeem is maybe not the right word. We, you know, we'll give you the money, but you, you still owe the money, right? So yeah. the whole that whole thing is, it's scary that they did that at all. And as a solution, it's one that I don't see that works long term. So double. Well, they're going to forgive it. Whatever the difference is between the market value of the paper that they're putting up there for collateral, right? The discount window, you discount your paper. Whatever that is the difference between the actual value and the pledged value, par value, the Fed will wind up eating it, right? Because and if they do, that's monetizing yeah. debt, right? That's that's just you money in another name. So Harry, you know, to, bring, to bring it back to our, our gold bug audience here, and you know, I don't say that as an insult. I consider myself a, a diet in the world gold bug. Probably, Probably, yeah. <laughs> I, I always remember Richard Russell when people would tell him he was a gold bug. He said, I'm not a gold bug. You're a dollar bug. Yeah, <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> but but to bring that back, okay, um, it, there are headwinds right now. And given that the so-called price of the dollar, I always refer to it as the gold dollar exchange ratio, because gold is money. The gold dollar exchange ratio is not determined by you or me or anybody going down to our local coin shop and buying an ounce or, or a tenth of an ounce or oh, whatever well. it is. It's fig it's determined we the prices quoted are these trades from futures traders and those guys don't think the way we do and they look at the you know the the foreign exchange like what i call the wrong trousers they look at the dxy they look at all these other variables for where they think the dollar is going to go um or its supposed value and and that's what sets the gold dollar exchange ratio in the markets on a day-to-day -day basis but that's a day-to-day -day basis ultimately if you look at a very long-term chart if you look at gold versus the dollar since 1971, it's like a big giant X, a somewhat droopy X, but it's a, you know, it's a big giant X. So if you take a step back and you look at it, there's nothing wrong with gold. It's not broken. It's doing its job. It's volatile, or rather really the dollar is volatile. Risk in the economy is volatile. But over the years, as the dollar has lost value, so has risen gold. So it, there's nothing wrong with it. You're not wrong. You're not crazy for believing in real value and real money. And at the end of the day, um, that does matter. Now, shorter term or even on any given year, you can see all kinds of things, headwinds. And right now we are facing headwinds. And uh, you know, I want to dislocate my shoulder, patting myself on the back, Carrie. But I have to say that since this summer, I was warning of this. I'm not such a blind gold bug. You know, I don't want to be a blind bull. There's a sword behind that red cape. So I've been warning people that the higher dollar, higher for longer, the appearance of Team Soft Landing's victory, these were headwinds for gold. And lo and behold, here we are. That's exactly how this is playing out right now. So it may sound like I'm raining on the parade, but I'm not. What I'm saying is, <laughs> you know, if as you started this show, as you said at the very outset, the goal isn't to be religious about gold or silver or any of our favorite assets. It's to make money. As an investor, my, my goal is to make money. So near term, I actually made a bearish call. So therefore, I hope you'll believe me and don't just think I'm a perma goal who always says, you know, buy, 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 buy. I was right about the near term headwinds. I think that this conversation we're having about the signal of the bond market means we're going, you know, hard landing is coming and that is gonna be very bullish for gold. So I do think we see a turnaround. I do see the near-term weakness as a buying opportunity. You may be sick of buying opportunities, but it is what it is. I do think this turns around in the not-too-distant future. And ultimately, long-term, remember that giant 50-year X, or 52 years now. Uh, you know, you're not wrong. Gold has real value. And if you can sit out the volatility, you'll do well. Couldn't agree with you more, Lobo. Hey, so bars rounds dust does it matter <laughs> rings jewelry. ultimately no um especially if you're talking long-term savings but if you need to trade or if you need to liquidate you know say 
you know, you have a personal emergency or an opportunity. You got to, you know, your dream house comes on sale and you got to dip into your long-term savings. If you've got, you know, dust that you've been panning out of rivers as a, as a hobby <laughs> for the last 40 years, that's going to be hard to sell uh, or get a good price for. Uh, and even bars are trickier. Whereas, uh, you know, an eagle is the most widely recognized uh, gold bullion coin around the world. You you can sell that anywhere. They they may, you know, want to test it or something, but you can sell it. Whereas other things, they're just more difficult. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying go out and pay crazy premiums for eagles. And a lot of people, because of this, they will pay, I think, unreasonable premiums. But when the markets fluctuate, when, when gold is down and nobody loves it, and you can get a low premium, then I would, by preference, I would go with the more recognized, easily fungible coins. Yeah, I agree. And hey, there's nothing wrong with maple leaves either. No, no. There's certain tax things that personally, personally, I might like for for just like almost the art or the collectability of the coin itself. I love the buffaloes. They're, yeah. they're you know they don't have the copper yeah. alloy. They're a little bit softer, so they they don't age well. Don't carry them in your pocket and clink it around with your change, right? But they're just beautiful. I love the art of them, and they have that much brighter shinier you know yellow or gold so from yeah. i i just i like the buffaloes but yeah maple leaves will do as well yeah and in the end like you said it's not going to matter but in the interim it could matter and you know like right now carrying an ounce of gold in your pocket is like carrying an 1800 dollar bill right <laughs> so you know who out there can cash an 1800 dollar bill so you want smaller denominations and that's where silver really comes in but hey, we're not about that. There's a million articles out there. You could go over to Miles Franklin or whatever, and they'll help you guide you through the process. Point is to have some because something is coming here. I don't want to, I don't claim to know what, I don't know, claim to know when, but there is a limit to how much the system can take. The system has been on, uh, you know, it's been in the ER for years, and now, <laughs> now it looks like the patient's about to leave us here, Lobo. I'll change metaphors. It's like you're watching one of these 1960s horror movies where the creepy music tells you the monster is coming, except this time I don't think it's the creature from the Black Lagoon. I think it's the creature from Jekyll Island. Mm. <laughs> Something is coming, and something's out there. And you, you go into the whole Great Reset thing. This is what they want. And maybe it's what they do want. But when you implode a system that has worked for 100 years, albeit not well at times, when you just take that system down and you don't really have a replacement, you have a theoretical replacement. Maybe we'll be doing SDRs and <laughs> uh, whatever. When you do that, that's really dangerous and you don't know what the unintended consequences are going to be. Couldn't agree more. All right. Hey, tell us your site, how we subscribe, why we should subscribe. <laughs> well, ho hopefully a little bit of my prescience as we've talked about in the show will give you a motivation, but the, the quick answer is independentspeculator.com. I have a free weekly digest that you can check it out and see if you agree with my way of looking at things. And and I promise we won't spam the heck out of you if you do. All right. That's cool. And uh, hey, take a look at the show notes of this interview on Financial Survival Network. You could click right through to Lobo's site. No problem. There's nothing in it for me. I just want to see people who are trying to help you for real profit, at least pay their costs and get to the next phase of whatever it is that they have planned here. In any event, if you got a question for Lobo or myself, shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. And uh, please like, share, subscribe, whatever else you do on YouTube so the word can get out. Lobo, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Thank you, Gary. <laughs>